Thank you. Uh, today I'm going to talk mainly about the third of the three papers of Carriol uh, and emphasize uh, the part of them that I understand best, which are the Hodge theoretic aspects. Um, in the third paper, uh, as I'll explain in a minute, uh, he looks at automorphic cohomology and does an expansion of automorphic cohomology around boundary components. This is all in a non-classical situation, uh, but the boundary components turn out to uh, have arithmetic meaning. <coughs> so by expanding cohomology around a boundary component, like expanding an automorphic uh, function around a cusp, uh, he can give some uh, meaning to what it, uh, some meaning to having, uh, if you like, arithmetically defined automorphic uh, forms in a non-classical case. So just recalling from uh, the general setting that uh, the initial interest was in the arithmetic aspects of a cuspidal automorphic representation of U2 whose infinite component corresponded to a degenerate limit of discrete series. The idea there was to realize this infinite component as the first cohomology group of a quotient by a co-compact discrete group of a homogeneous complex manifold where D as a homogeneous complex manifold is SU21 divided by a maximal torus with a non-classical complex structure. And what this means is uh, that this homogeneous complex manifold does not fiber either holomorphically or anti-holomorphically over a Hermitian symmetric domain. The only Hermitian symmetric domains that are around in this case are the unit ball, uh, SU2 comma 1 divided by U2. And so there are only two possibilities, the ball and the cut uh, with its two complex structures. And this is the, uh, the complex structure that does not factor fiber holomorphically over either of those. Um, the, uh, as I'm going to go through the material, I want to talk about the aspects of what Carriol did uh, and comment on those that have some generality and those that really are specific to uh, his case. Now, One of the constructions that he did uh, in the first two papers was uh, to look at what we've been calling a correspondence space. This is a complex manifold that uh, has special properties that it is a Stein manifold. These Ds here are, are not Stein manifolds. They're very far from being a Stein manifold. Um, but this one is a Stein manifold and the fibers are contractible Stein manifolds. Uh, this construction, I think, has some generality. Uh, there's a candidate in general for what this W should be, uh, which is the, it's an open set in the quo quotient space of the complex Lie group divided by the complexification of a maximal torus. And you can think of this in a certain sense as flags in, in general position. And I'll illustrate that in a minute. 
So this has not been proved to have these properties in generality, but it has been uh, proved to work in Carriel's case and in a couple of other low dimensional cases where you can just see the construction. So if you recall the picture in Carriel's case was you have the unit ball in P2 and this D was represented as flags of a point outside the ball and a line that meets the ball. So here you recall that we're looking in C3 with a Hermitian form of signature 2, 1. So that means that the unit ball is then defined. Uh, those would be the vectors of negative length, if you like. And that sits in a C2. These flags, you can think of them as the point outside the ball. So the Hermitian form is positive. Uh, on the point, and the fact that the line meets the ball means the dual Hermitian form, thinking of the line as a point in the dual space, should be negative. Okay. So there are flags with, uh, with these geometric properties. And the space W then had this picture. So you have two flags in general position. Okay, a flag is a point on a line. And uh, among the flags in general position, you take an open set where the lines intersect inside the ball. And the line joining these two points lies outside the ball. Okay, so that's an open set in if you like pairs of flags in general position, and you can identify pairs of flags in general position just in projective in P2 with this quotient space here. I mean, you can think of it sort of this way that the subgroup of the complex group, so forget now the Hermitian form, just think projective geometry the subgroup of the complex group that leaves invariant a given flag is a parabolic subgroup. Okay. It's a minimal parabolic subgroup. So leaving uh, a pair of flags in general position, the isotropy group for that configuration is the complex group modulo the intersection of two parabolic groups that are in some sense opposite. Think of the positive roots and the negative roots. Those intersect in the maximal complexification of a maximal torus. Okay. So that's a sort of projective picture. And then you take the open set given by these conditions. Okay. There is another interpretation, uh, which is to think of Carriel's D as the Mumford-Tate domain. that parameterizes polarized Hodge structures on a vector space of dimension 6, defined over the rationals and rational vector space, with an alternating form. So these will be polarized Hodge structures of odd weight, n equals 3, and which have an action by a quadratic imaginary field. So, okay, so you're looking at polarized Hodge structures of weight 3 with an F action and some compatibility with this quadratic form Q here. Then the complexification of the vector space into the eigenspaces, not 
So you tensor the vector space with F, and then it decomposes into positive and negative eigenspaces for the action of F. And this V plus is the C3 that's there. These polarized Hodge structures, uh, when you do this decomposition, have this picture. for the complexification. So this is the H30 part, the H21 part, the H12 part, and the H03 part. So if you know this much, then you know the rest, because the conjugate of this is this, and the conjugate of this is this, and so on. So knowing just the, f the flag in the first half, the C3, gives you the whole Hodge structure. And these inequalities over here are just the Riemann bilinear relations, the second Hodge Riemann bilinear relations, where you have a positive sign on the, HV, on the H3 zero space and a negative sign here. It's an alternation of signs. Okay. So that's a sort of Hodge theoretic interpretation of those inequalities. Well, one can do a similar thing with, for example, SO4, comma 1, divided by maximal torus, with, uh, where you think of SO4, comma 1, divided by the unitary group as the Mumford-Tate domain, in this case the period domain, of all polarized Hodge structures on a vector space of uh, dimension 5, and where Q is symmetric. And the polarized Hodge structures then are uh, V2, 0, direct sum of V1, 1, direct sum of V0, 2, where the Hodge number, the dimension here, is 2. So the, these two spaces add up to a subspace defined over the reals on which the form Q is positive. And here the form Q is negative, that's the SO4 comma 1. And the subgroup of the orthogonal group for Q that leaves invariant a fixed Hodge decomposition like this is just the unitary group here. That's plus or minus 1 there, but you know, leave that aside. So we can think of this as these sorts of Hodge structures. And this then becomes the set of Hodge flags. where this is the orthogonal of this, and this is the orthogonal of that, and you have some conditions on the flag. Okay. So instead of the Hodge decomposition, you take the flag space. So a line in here, this two-dimensional space, then this three-dimensional space, and then the orthogonal of the line here. So that's a Hodge flag. And then you can talk about Hodge flags in general position. Just the notion of two flags being in general position is well defined. Okay. The complementary dimensional subspaces should meet only at the origin. And then an open set in that is uh, given by these sorts of uh, relations that, that you saw here. That then defines a correspondent space in this example. It's a Stein manifold with contractible Stein fibers. All this is just to illustrate that there may be some generality into this, in this part of what Curiel did. <coughs> in this case, something which is special, however, is that this same W of fibers not only over the D that he was interested in, the non-classical one, but it fibers over a D prime, where D prime 
you can think of as uh, the uh, set of flags where the point lies in the ball and the line meets the ball. And this configuration here, uh, you map this configuration to this point P and say the first, the line L. So that gives a holomorphic fibration over D prime, which itself maps over the ball just by sending it to this point P. Okay. So this is a classical object. This is a non-classical object. This also has a Hodge theoretic interpretation because if you look at polarized abelian varieties of dimension three with an F action, okay, then this is the parameter space. The ball is the parameter space for these, and this is the flags associated uh, to the Hodge structure. So the picture of the Hodge structure here pictures right. That's right. So here the Hermitian form is positive on both of these because the points in, or it's negative if you like, the points in the ball and the line meets the ball. So the Hermitian form has the same sign on both of these. So that's the positivity of the Hodge Riemann bilinear relations on an H10. And then it's negative on, uh, well, on the remaining. It has signature 2, 1, so it has to be negative there. So again, this has a Hodge theoretic interpretation as the Hodge flags for these types of Hodge structures of weight 1 and abelian varieties of genus 3 with an F action. This would be relevant later when I talk about the boundary components because from a Hodge theoretic point of view, they have a very natural uh, interpretation. Anyway, Carroll then, as you perhaps remember, used this diagram plus the Penrose type transforms to move cohomology from here over to here by uh, taking coherent cohomology here and representing it by global holomorphic objects here on each side. And that was what led to some arithmetic meaning. Uh, four classes, when you factored this by the discrete group, led to some arithmetic meaning for classes in H1 here that via these Penrose type transforms, when you move them over, they have arithmetic definitions here. This is very special that, uh, that this correspondence space can have a fibration over something non-classical and over something classical. Uh, I don't know further examples of this. There probably are some, and I haven't looked hard. But uh, you're not going to get, for example, uh, G2 this way. So the third paper of Curiel's, which I'll talk about today, uh, yeah.
about. Yeah, for G two, there's no possibility of fibering over Hermitian symmetric over a non over a classical object. So G two doesn't operate on a Hermitian symmetric domain. So okay, you can't get at it uh, using Hermitian symmetric domains or things holomorphic things over them. There are other exceptional Lie groups that do operate on Hermitian symmetric domains, but so far as I know, the algebra geometric meaning of those uh, is not clear. You know, they're not moduli spaces, uh, at least so far as I know. So it's just G2 is a favorite of mine, so I always bring it up. Um, so what talk today will be about is the, uh, the following, that there are, I'm going to call them uh, completions, and I'll explain the reason for the word, of the carryalls D sigma, or more generally, of some Mumford-Tate domains. This is not known in general, only in special cases. There are completions. to which the action of an arithmetic group extends to give a quotient, which I'm going to call x sub sigma, uh, that contains the original x, where this sigma is what's called a fan. I'm not going to define this. Uh, those of you who studied the, the toroidal compactifications, it's, uh, it's the fan as in that. Okay. Um, and the fans that I'll be using today will be very simple, uh, very simple ones. Uh, so there's a construction by Kato and Osui of these objects here, which you think of as taking these quotients and adding on some boundary pieces. And completion means that if you have a variation of Hodge structure, say, over a punctured polycylinder, that that extends to the completion. Here you have to assume that the monodromies are unipotent. They compute, they commute, and they should be unipotent. Uh, and this is a a variation of hot structure. So think of it as a family of algebraic varieties parameterized by something like C2 taking out the axes, a punctured polycylinder. And what the Katu-Usui theory tells you is how to stick in sort of a limiting Hodge structure at the, where the varieties become singular. So intuitively, you're going to add some sort of Hodge theoretic objects to these boundaries. So I'll describe in uh, the case of Carriol uh, what this d sigma and the quotient looks like. And then what he did was to take this automorphic cohomology and expand it around a boundary component. So in this case, the boundary components that we're going to be interested in, there'll be two of them. There'll be an E prime and an E double prime. And I'm just going to call it E to be either one of them. The boundary component will be a CM elliptic curve. So you think of restricting a cohomology class here uh, to a neighborhood of the boundary, and it's like a Laurent series. You expand it in powers of the normal bundle, the co-normal bundle, just like expanding an analytic function 
around a point, you can expand cohomology around a submanifold. Well, this is an arithmetic object, and the normal bundle will turn out to be an arithmetic object. In fact, it's arithmetically trivial, if you like. It's trivial as an arithmetic object. So sections in H1 of E with coefficients in this line bundle, which is going to be extended in a natural way, tensor powers of the dual normal bundle. That's what you'll get when you expand uh, a class here and restrict it to a neighborhood of the boundary. There'd be a cohomology with, on the CM elliptic curve with coefficients in a line bundle that has an arithmetic structure. So you can say what it means for those sections to be arithmetic. And will be explicit formulas in terms of theta functions and stuff. Isomorphic? Yes. No. Uh, so, Car what Cariel, Cariel's theorem, I think this will answer your question, is uh, that this will allow one to define going backward in these diagrams, it's going to allow one to define a subspace of this consisting of arithmetic classes and to show it's big. So the theorem informally stated is that H1 of x L lambda has a large, but we don't know that it's the whole thing, subspace of arithmetically defined classes. Uh, I don't think so. I think it, it's a more complicated because these kata usui uh, spaces are um, even, well first, to an algebraic geometer, these d's and d by gammas are strange because they're not algebraic varieties and far from it. Well, so, so there's a complex geometer, they're fine. To a complex geometer, these things are strange <laughs> uh, because they're what are called slit analytic varieties. And I'll say what that is later on. But the topology that you put on these things to make things work uh, is uh, non-standard, certainly. In Cariel's case, he avoids this by a trick that I'll explain. And it's that trick that doesn't allow you to say really what the neighborhood of the whole boundary component looks like, only a slice that you can see. So what I want to um, do today, I, I made some notes which I'll pass out at the end that have the, you know, the precise statement of the theorem and the details that I just won't have time to go into. Maybe I should write up the theorem at least. So we're going to end up with uh, a diagram like this. So let me just say what the notations are going to be. When one deals with these uh, extensions here, you have to worry the boundary components correspond to uh, nilpotent cones. That is, you, th you have uh, these uh, monodromy transformations and you call Ti the monodromy around the ith disk. Then it has a log because it's unipotent and you'll get commuting nilpotent elements in the Lie algebra. And they generate a certain cone. These fans are made up of these cones with certain properties among them. 
So the sigma is going to be one particular nilpotent cone, which is the span of, uh, in this case, there'll be one monodromy transformation. So you'll only have to worry about uh, a single monodromy transformation for reasons, Hodge theoretic reasons I'll explain. So instead of a fan, you have just the cone consisting of essentially a nilpotent element in the Lie algebra and the origin. So there's going to be a diagram like this, which are these Kato Usui extensions, but just for this very simple uh, situation of just one monodromy. So you stick something onto the boundary of the non-classical object, you stick something on the boundary of this classical object, and that projects onto uh, a, a sticking something on the boundary of Y prime, where Y prime is quotient by gamma of the ball. So it's a ball quotient, and you have a particular unipotent transformation corresponding to a point, a cusp on the boundary. It's a singular boundary point. So this will be a partial compactification of the quotient of the unit ball okay, by an arithmetic group. And Cariel's theorem is this. Let f prime, and there'll be a line bundle uh, that'll be natural in the picture, be a parabolic Picard automorphic form. So these are automorphic forms on ball quotients which have the usual property that they, in this case, they'll vanish at this singular point, the cusp. Be a pick of weight k bigger than or equal to 2. And let omega prime be the Penrose transform of F prime, which will be an H1 of X L lambda. So this F prime uh, is on a quotient here. It can be lifted to something here, and by the Penrose transform, moved to an H1 there by the mechanism in the first lecture. So that will be now a automorphic cohomology on this non-classical object. Then the image of P prime is generated by classes that are rational. over the maximal abelian extension of F, so arithmetic classes. But it's only the image of this Penrose transform that is arithmetic. So it's generated by classes, yeah, I'm sorry, the image is generated by classes that are rational over this field in the sense that when they are expanded, about the boundary component over here, which will be called E, about the boundary component 
uh, the coefficients in the expansion are rational over that field. So what you're going to be doing is taking something in H1 and expanding it in, uh, in terms, the coefficients in the expansion will be in these cohomology groups. These will have arithmetic meaning because this is a CM elliptic curve and these line bundles will be arithmetically defined. So the gist of the theorem then is that if you start with something that's arithmetic over here in the class usual sense and you move it over here, quotienting it by gamma and expand it around the boundary component, that there arithmetic things go to arithmetic things. So that Sorry? You were saying you are not going to have some decomposition. You have to kind of reduce this notion of the expansion. So here, is it only the conclusion of the first and zero term that can expand? No, it's all the coefficients. There'll be formulas. Uh, the line bundle is trivial. The normal bundle is trivial. So. Uh, I think you're right. I think the formulas, let, I'll write the formulas down and see what they mean. With x prime, yes. you also, yeah. you know. That's right. So the, to me, the, uh, as an algebraic geometer or analytic geometer, the interesting part of the story is the boundary structure and how can you take one of these strange objects, automorphic cohomology, and at least see it uh, on the boundary or in the neighborhood of the boundary? So, Um, so I'm going to assume uh, the definition of a mixed Hodge structure. It's in the notes, and I think that's probably familiar to everyone. Uh, here the relevant notion is going to be a limiting mixed Hodge structure. So that's going to be given by a vector space and a bilinear form, uh, either symmetric or alternating and the nilpotent transformation and a filtration on the complexification uh, with the following properties. The nilpotent transformation, some minimal power of it is zero because it's a nilpotent matrix. So think of the log of monogramming. That then defines a weight filtration. The weight filtration is the unique filtration, I'll leave all the ends here, it's the unique filtration such that N shifts the weight 
down by two. And such that the kth power from weight n plus k to n minus k is an isomorphism. It's like in the Lefschetz theorem, except that the L's are going the opposite direction. So that's the monodromy weight filtration associated to a nilpotent transformation. And the data with a monodromy weight filtration put in, and this F is going to be a Hodge filtration Uh, that uh, this should give you a, um, a, I don't want to say it. This should give you a mixed Hodge structure. So this data with this weight filtration and this filtration here gives a mixed Hodge structure. And in fact, it's a polarized mixed Hodge structure. So these will be the things that will be put on the boundary. In general, you have a cone generated by a set of commuting nilpotent transformations. But here today, we're only going to be concerned with one. Um, and I'll. The polarized mixed Hodge structure, um, I'll say what that means in a special case when I illustrate it. You have that the front of the boundary corresponds to the derivative? You have what? That the front of the boundary corresponds to the derivative? So you need the weight filtration, the monodromy weight filtration. No, you, you, you would just have the, I think. Or have the neighborhood of information? Oh, this is just the stuff that will go on the boundary. Well, uh, not, it's not a boundary, I'm sorry. You have to take the nilpotent orbits, mm -hmm. and I'll come to that in a minute. But these, in first approximation, these will be the things you'll stick on the boundary. You know, the actual things you'll stick on will be these nilpotent orbits stuck in in a certain way. Okay. So uh, for these limiting are the, these are going to be called limiting mixed Hodge structures. And the, in, uh, in practice, you can draw pictures and see what they will be. So for example, let's take the case So this is weight two Hodge structures whose Hodge number H20 uh, is two. And what you find is the only possibility, you have to have a five-dimensional vector space. And you draw pictures of these mixed Hodge structures like a Hodge diamond. So this is of type 2, 2, 1, 1. 0, 0, and the graded. This is 2, 0, and 0, 2. So this is what you would find if you looked in the Hodge structures whose period domain is SO4, comma 1, by U2, the sorts of things that they would degenerate to. Okay. And if you just go through what the conditions to give a polarized mixed Hodge structure are, you find this is the only possibility, where this is the monodromy transformation here. You can rule out any other picture. So um, the fact that the uh, mixed Hodge structure is polarized is going to mean that this piece, this H piece, which this part, this, the second part here, the second graded piece, will be the primitive part 
direct sum the image of, in this case, the fourth graded piece. So the primitive part is this part here, and the image, it's like in Kähler geometry. The image here is the imprimitive part. So this 2, 0 plus 0, 2 is the primitive <coughs> part. So you have a two-dimensional rational vector space with a Hodge structure having an H20 and an H02. That's all. And the polarizing form tells you for this Hodge structure here, I'll just write it H is H20 over the complex numbers plus H02. The Q of H20 with itself, the polarizing form, gives a quadratic relation with rational coefficients. So you think of this as a line in, in, uh, in uh, P2 defined over Q because H is a rational vector space. And when you, so you have a line in uh, two dimensional, you have, a, uh, yeah. Right. Fine. So uh, you have this quadratic relation. Now, the extension data in the mixed Hodge structure. So the mixed Hodge structure gives you not just the graded pieces, but the extension data. And the extension data that I drew there, it's in X1 of mixed Hodge structures of Q or Z, if you put in Z coefficients, minus 2 H. That's isomorphic to H02 modulo HZ. If you have a lattice, say, an integral lattice. Okay. So this is a one-dimensional complex vector space factored by a two-dimensional lattice. And this condition here means that this elliptic curve is of CM type. So you get a CM elliptic curve. You can think of, yeah, it's the usual thing that if you have a complex vector space divided, well, yeah, you get a CM elliptic curve. So what you're seeing is even in this non-classical object sitting on the boundary, you'll have things that are classical and have arithmetic meaning. Okay. This is a sort of simplest example I know of that phenomenon. So the next example is going to be the carryall example. So these will be the list of the limiting mixed Hodge structures. There are three of them that are possible in Carriol's case. So you have to have a six-dimensional vector space and so on. And the ends do this. This is the case, n cubed is always zero, but n squared is non-zero. So the monodromy is nilpotent of order three. So n squared, though, can be non-zero. And this is the only case, if you just uh, look at it, that can occur. The what? Yeah, yeah. The second one is this picture. So the monodromy goes like this. 
and this is stuff of type 2, 1, and 1, 2 in the middle. So this is the graded 4 piece, the graded 3 piece, and the graded 2 piece. And the third kind, the picture of the limiting mixed Hodge structure is this one. This will be of type 2, 2 and two copies of that. And this is of type 3, 0 and 0, 3. So what you're seeing again on the boundary is stuff that looks a little bit like in the previous case. They're sort of rigid uh, Hodge structures. Okay. Geometrically, uh, well, I'll give the geometric picture later of this. So these are the three possible limiting mixed Hodge structures in Carriol's case. In this one, n squared is zero, but n is non-zero. And this is the boundary component that he will be using. So if you like, it's the simpler boundary component. Uh, hmm? uh, these two uh, will be, uh, I said there was going to be a, an, an x prime and an x double prime. That will correspond to this one and this one. So he actually uses two of them. Okay. So the next step then is, uh, this is just to see, get a picture of what possible degenerations might occur in Creole's case. The next step is what exactly, how to exactly do exactly do you define boundary components and glue them in to the space? So here we need the definition of a nilpotent orbit. So this is a, you're going to be given a nilpotent transformation and a filtration that uh, will satisfy only the first of the two hodge riemann bellinier relations. In other words, this will be, if you like, in the dual of the Mumford-Tate domain. In Carriol's case, it's in P2 cross P2. It's on the incidence variety. Okay, it need not be a point in D. Then a nilpotent orbit is given by the map of C into uh, D hat given by sending complex number W into the exponential. So it's going to be an orbit of the exponential of this nilpotent transformation, the orbit of a filtration, satisfying two conditions. The first is that the filtration here shifts by one, okay, under the nilpotent transformation. It's a very special property. In weight one, this is automatically satisfied, but in higher weight, it's a condition. And the second is that the, this point is in D for the imaginary part of W sufficiently positive. The way nilpotent orbits arose originally geometrically was that if you have a family of varieties over the disk with a singular variety over the origin, then the monodromy transformation is unipotent if you go to a finite cover of the disk. It has a logarithm. And you can look at what happens to the Hodge structure as the variety becomes singular. And one of Schmidt's early theorems was that that's approximated in a precise sense by a nilpotent orbit. 
So it replaces a general period mapping, if you like, by one that's group theoretic in nature. It's an orbit of a nilpotent transformation satisfying these two properties. So associated to a nilpotent orbit is a subset of d hat, which is just going to be the exponential of the span of the cone applied to f dot. So this is a subset of this compact dual, where sigma c is just, in this case, it's just the complex numbers times n. So it's the whole complex span of the nilpotent transformation. Just to give a little bit of the flavor of what is going on, if you have a degenerating family of elliptic curves over the disk, say with coordinate q, then uh, and assume that the uh, limit curve is semi-stable or so the mon monodromy is unipotent, then the period of the elliptic curve, the point in the upper half plane, classically – do I have it right? Yeah. So the point in the upper half plane that's given by the period of the elliptic curve it's not well defined because you have the monodromy transformation. That's the log that comes in. So in this case, the monodromy matrix, the log of monodromy is that. So that's the, what any period of a degenerating family of elliptic curves looks like. The nilpotent orbit. is you just replace – this is a holomorphic function and you just replace it by its constant term. So that's the nilpotent orbit. Okay. And the z, in this case, let's we'll just take the case n equals 1. Uh, so I'm still working now in the case of just elliptic curves. A point in – a filtration is just a point in P1. It's just a line in C2. So you think of it as homogeneous coordinates x and y. And here n is 0, 1, 0, 0. The simplest situation. Then the condition to have a nilpotent orbit – this one is out because the filtration is just an F1 and an F0. This condition implies that y is non-zero. So we can take the point to be x comma 1. And then z is just the set of points x plus w, 1. Because that's when you exponentiate n and apply it to this point, this is what you get. So if you like, uh, this is just P1 minus uh, the origin. That's the point 1 comma 0. So this z is all of P1 taking out the origin. It does include the point at infinity in this case. You see, geometrically, you get the same thing if you reparameterize by just shifting the coordinate in the complex uh, line, shifting w by 1, just translating it. So from a geometric point of view, you really should look at nilpotent orbits modulo reparameterization.
So the first extension is d sigma, which is just the set of, I'm going to call them sigma nilpotent orbits. So sigma in this case is just the positive reals times n. And as a set, there are only two points here. First, this contains the domain D itself, which is the nilpotent orbit. I'm sorry, this is R bigger than or equal to zero. This is just the, uh, the nilpotent orbit, the trivial nilpotent orbit, corresponding to the origin. And so the fan in this case is just the uh, one-dimensional positive reals and the, and the faces, which just consist of the origin. So it's just two points, essentially. So the set of nilpot sigma nilpotent orbits contains D. So it's D union the set of Zs. Uh, where those were described here. That's this tilde because I want to factor this thing by rescaling. In other words, I'll identify a z and a z prime if they differ just by a rescaling. You translate w by some fixed number fixed complex number. So this will be d sigma. So what you're adding to the domain is just the set of nilpotent orbits modular rescalings. If you let gamma sigma be the normalizer of sigma intersect gamma, that's where the discrete group comes in then uh, gamma sigma operates on this. And this extension, x sigma, is the quotient. So that's the um, enlarged space. You're sticking on uh, to the boundary these nilpotent orbits modular rescaling and then factoring by this group that's the normalizer of the nilpotent cone in the arithmetic group. In the notes, you'll see the example in detail worked out for SO4, comma 1. Uh, so I won't go through that here. I want to do the carryall case. The SO4, comma 1 is simpler because there, there's only one boundary component. There's only one type of limiting mixed Hodge structure. That's right. So yeah. that's, is the whole of the sigma that's right. But your rescaling only affects the nilpotent, proper nilpotent orbits, not the interior. In the classical case, this is not a full compactification. It's only a piece of the compactification corresponding to this one, in this case, nilpotent transformation. This, if you have a fan, this will embed in the X sigma. That's right. I mean, the way to think of it, you can think of it this way. Suppose you have several cusps, all right? We're just picking out one, 
and looking at that. It's, it's that picture. So coming to Carriol's case, um, The notation works better if you take your Hermitian form to be this one. Okay. So here I'm thinking of the H of the F vector space V plus and the Hermitian form in terms of a basis, an F basis, as having this matrix. Okay, so it's of signature 2, 1. The reason that works better is then the, well, first the Lie algebra of U2, 1 is just the set of matrices A, B, C, D, E, B bar. This is all written out in the notes, so minus A bar. where these are pure imaginary, and A, B, D are complex numbers. That's just the Lie algebra preserving this Hermitian form over the complexes. And any nilpotent orbit, or any nilpotent transformation, can be conjugated to be upper triangular. If you took your Hermitian form, for example, to be diagonal, then this would be more complicated. But to make it upper triangular, you put the form on the anti-diagonal. Then there's a nice uh, little argument, which I'm not going to have time to give. It's in the notes, that if you look at nilpotent cones, they can have dimension at most two. In other words, you can find a linearly independent pair of commuting nilpotent transformations in this Lie algebra. That's the first point. But the second point is that uh, nilpotent orbits Uh, imply that the dimension is less or equal to 1. In other words, you cannot have a pair of commuting nilpotent transformations that simultaneously satisfy the condition that Mi of, in this case, uh, F3 is contained in F2. And these Fs are things that give you um, a, a nilpotent orbit. That is, they satisfy this condition that the exponential of some, of the exponential puts you inside the domain D, satisfying those of bilinear relations. These commuting implies that they're linearly independent. So when you are going to do these Kato-Usui compactifications, in Carriol's case, you don't have to worry about higher dimensional cones. You, you have just w one dimensional cones. If you have, so the exact statement is this, that if you have a filtration such that the exponential of W1, N1 plus W2 and 2 is in D, 
for the imaginary part of W1, W2 sufficiently large. Okay? If you have this condition and these commute, that implies that they're linearly independent. This condition here, linearly dependent. Yeah, sorry, it implies they're linearly dependent. So the next step then is to see what the monodromy matrix is in those three cases that I wrote down. Uh, the first case, n squared non-zero, the monodromy matrix turns out to look like this, where alpha is an integer and B is real. And alpha is an integer in the number field. In the case n equals zero, the monodromy matrix is much simpler. Where B is non-zero real. And the two cases where B is positive and B negative, those are the cases B and C in terms of the limiting mixed Hodge structure earlier. I think what I'm going to do now, just because of time, is just summarize uh, how you glue the boundary component in. And from that, you'll be able to see where the elliptic curve on the boundary comes from where it appears. So the next step is gluing in the boundary component. And for this, one takes there's going to be, again, a rescaling. So one takes a space uh, consisting of pairs of complex numbers, C, and filtrations, satisfying the following condition. If C is non-zero, then the exponential of log c over 2 pi i n of this filtration is in d. It doesn't matter which branch of the logarithm you choose because n uh, is in the Lie algebra of the group that leaves d invariant. And if c equals 0, then uh, exponential of sigma c times f dot is a nilpotent orbit. So the way to think of this is um, if if you write C as just a real number, then as R goes to zero, this thing goes to I infinity. So this complex number here is, is sort of like IE to the IY, where Y is going to infinity operating on N. Geometrically, it's like going along the vertical axis in the upper half plane. Okay? And so as R is going to zero, you're sort of going to infinity. And at r equals zero, what you stick in is this nilpotent orbit. Okay. 
So that's just a set. And then Z sigma is Z, oh, I have to tell you how C acts by lambda on C F dot is uh, exponential of 2 pi i lambda C exponential of minus lambda n F dot. <coughs> so that's an action of C, the complex line on this set. And Z sigma is the quotient. So that set is going to describe a neighborhood of the boundary component. The boundary component corresponding c equals zero is the set of nilpotent orbits modulo rescalings, because that's, that's the effect of this. If you go back to the elliptic curve case over there and just trace through what this does, it exactly uh, does what it's supposed to. You have a degenerating family of elliptic curves over the disk and it sticks in the origin. It's the usual adding a cusp. So I will omit uh, some of the calculations here. Ah. Excuse me? No. So the As the topology that you put on this thing to make it work is this strange uh, topology where it's what's called a slit analytic space. So a slit analytic space means that you take C2 uh, minus uh, uh, sort of this part, minus a half line. I'm sorry, you take C2 minus the line and you stick in the origin. So it's C2 minus a line and then you stick back in the origin. So it's called an analytic variety with slits. Uh, it seems amenable to log geometry. Uh, you know, I think it, it looks a little more natural in the log analytic setting than here. This makes, this is what the topology that's forced on you if you want a separated quotient space. Well, you mean to induce the photo decomposition? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the gamma sigma, the normalizer of sigma in this case, is the set of matrices um, of the following kind. One, alpha beta, zero, one, alpha bar, zero, zero, one, where alpha and beta are integers in the number field, and beta plus its conjugate is alpha squared. So that's the normalizer of this n that I wrote down there. And beta has a certain relation to b, which I'll come to in a minute. The points, I'm going to think of elements in C3 and P2 is given just by column vectors and what one finds is uh, that the points that are on nilpotent orbits after rescaling can always be taken to be, well, where did I have it? Yeah.
So this are the coordinates of a point in C3. The homogeneous coordinates are the point in the usual picture. But the point P now need not be in, it can be, it need not, the point PL is only in D hat. It need not be in D. And the line can be taken to be this. So what I'm doing is describing those filtrations that give nilpotent orbits after you rescale. So we're looking at all the filtrations, that's a point on a line, that for this n here give a nilpotent orbit. And after rescaling, this is what the points look like. The action of this transformation takes P L into P prime L prime, where P prime is um, alpha y plus beta, y plus alpha bar, one, and L prime is zero, one, minus alpha bar, minus y. So the geometric interpretation of the, uh, of the nilpotent orbits that you get in these cases, there are three cases. Excuse me? Yeah. So the nilpotent orbits take place in P2 cross the dual in the incidence variety. So points there look like that, point on a line. The first case, case A, the nilpotent orbit, both the point and the line move, but keeping the incidence. Case B, L is fixed and the point moves on the line. And that's case B. In case C, the point is fixed and the line pivots around the point. So these are particular kinds of orbits where both the point and the line can move, or the line is fixed, but the point moves on the line. You see that happening here. This point is not affected by the group, and if you do the nilpotent orbit for this L here, you'll find that it leaves this fixed, but it moves this. Okay? So that's the geometric interpretation of these nilpotent orbits. In any case, you need now to rescale. You always have to normalize by making the first coordinate zero by moving in the nilpotent orbit. Okay. So that goes out. And what you find then is that the action of this gamma sigma, where y is the coordinate, looks like c. The action of this group, gamma sigma, the normalizer, acts on the complex line by y goes into y plus alpha bar. That just minus that. So the quotient then of the boundary component uh, is, well, is uh, C modulo the integers in this field. That's where it comes from. Now I've skipped steps here because really what I've given you are the points on the boundary, not the whole nilpotent orbit. That computation is in the notes. But I wanted to at least just show a little bit the flavor of um, how the boundary component, how the elliptic curve sh shows up on the boundary component. Going back to uh, the sort of general remarks I was making in the beginning, uh, this part of what Carriol did, uh, I would say, could have some generality in the sense that frequently, it's not at all uncommon that when you stick boundary components onto Mumford-Tate domains, even though the Mumford-Tate domain is non-classical, the boundary components may turn out to be classical. And the more and more you degenerate them, the more they tend to look classical. I mean, that's just a heur heuristic statement. So, for example, 
Uh, the one I gave with SO4, comma 1, the boundary components are all classical, meaning it's an algebra geometric object. If you do SP4 modulo its maximal torus, which you think of as the parameter space for polarized Hodge structures of mirror quintic type, weight 3, all Hodge numbers equal 1. Those boundary components have been classified, and it's a, it's a nice short list, and they all have arithmetic meaning like this. So the uh, method of taking cohomology and expanding it around an arithmetically defined boundary component I think has at least feasibility in cases beyond what Carroll did, at least some low dimensional cases. Okay, thank you. I think I'll stop here.